Sa Italy. I hope that the short movie with the title His Story that we have watched can give us a nice introduction into this discussion. It is not easy to introduce a man like Mooney in 30 minutes though. This panel discussion actually is part, a part of a series of events called Canberra Anola Klupa. It is organized by PPIA or the Indonesian Student Association in cooperation with Indonesia Synergy. Canberra Anola Klupa, a KJ tagline in Indonesian language, simply means Canberra refuse to forget. By the phrase menolak lupa or refuse to forget, we want to show that the Indonesian diaspora will never forget the gross violation of human rights happened in the past in whatsoever forms. As long as the justice is not done, the diaspora will remind and demand the government to solve and investigate the violations. One of such gross violations is surely the murder of our friends, Munir Said Tali. Kami menolak lupa. We refuse to forget. We believe that to remember is moral obligation. Remembering is the path to an awareness of the deaths of history that we have not yet settled with the victims of gross violation of human rights. We refuse to forget until justice crawls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Why Canberra? In our tagline, why Canberra Mola Klupa? Canberra is the city in which the 10 years commemoration of Munir death is started. From Canberra, the Manolak Lupa movement, if I might call it, then spreads to other cities in Australia. Thus, similar events will also be held in several states, such as in New South Wales, with Sydney Manolak Lupa, in Victoria, with Melbourne Manolak Lupa, in Queensland, with Brisbane Manolak Lupa, and also in Indonesia, like in Jakarta. This series of events has also been reported in Indonesian mass media such as Kompas, Tempo, Metro TV, Detik, and also internationally such as in the site of GIV, Global Indonesian Voices. In this occasion, I would like to share and tell you the series of events in commemorating the death of Munir. First, starting from 24 of August, PPIA organized literature competition for Indonesian native and second language speaker around the world in which 30 poems were already submitted. <coughs> they are written by people from various backgrounds, from elementary school students to, to the university lecturer. <coughs> For your information, the winners of this competition will also be announced today in this venue, in this event. Second, on 25 of August, PPIA organized social media campaign through Twitter by using Twiven and tweeting to the official Twitter of the account of Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono and the President-elect Jokowi to solve the murder of Munir. The tweet says, Pak Jokowi Dodo, mohon tuntaskan ujian sejarah kita dari Pak Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono dengan menuntaskan kasus Munir. The committee also encouraged netizen or social media user to sign the petition in www.change.org. The campaign is also through Facebook, in which 10 years of Munir photo, you can see it near your seat, was created so that Facebook user can show solidarity by using that photo until 7 of September. Third, on 2nd September, which is today, the movie screening and the panel discussion is organized. Fourth, on 6th of September, in the morning, an event called Walk for Justice will also be organized. It is 10 kilometers around Canberra and the 10 kilometers symbolizing 10 years of Munir death. Fifth, last one, on 13th of September, in the afternoon, an event called Pray for Munir will also be held in Anuma Musalla. That's all the events which are called Canberra Munala Lupa. To close this welcome speech, I would, like, I would like to explain why Munir, why commemorating him. In terms of Munir and injustice, I would like to emphasize that PPIA, or the Indonesian Student Associations, that science for science's sake is not enough. It is science for change that it is needed. Finally, on behalf of the committee, I would like all of you to join us in the remaining event, which is 6th of September, Walk of Justice. And if you don't sign the petition yet, please do sign the petitions in www.change.org. Thank you.
For the next, we have poetry recitation. I would like to welcome a prominent Indonesian poet living in Canberra who just launched her magnum opus days ago at Baldur's Increasing Building, Zubaydah Juhat. She will be hosting all of us for about 20 minutes in re reciting poems on Munir. Also, she will announce the winner of the literature competitions. For Zubaydah, the floor is yours.
eight-year-old children. Another thing that makes us happy, Gurinda become one of our contested in this evening. This is incredible and touching. We are the three seminar, yeah, Sinta Konyasi, Amri Vidodo, and me, Zubaydah Johar, <coughs> deliver a high appreciation to all participants. Every world has its own strength and color such thing. The winning of the getting popular of the church. In particular, those with the humanitarian messages. Given the contest takes only three ranking. Based on the criteria of the action, which is the weight of message delivery, fame and smartness in choosing words, we will announce the three titles. In the first place is Munir and Dasawasa. In the second place is Gurinda Mpapuas. In the third place is Untukmu Bisama. The award will be handed by the committee chairman, Bung Sohib. All of our contribution will become one of the power to fight against crudity. We will de dedicate this for justice, for Munir, Marsina, Wijitupur, Ace, Papua, Trisakti, Semangi, Talangsari, and those who struggle for peace. As a conclusion, I will read the poetry which gave the first rain and a one Gurinda with the second rain. Munir dalam dasawasa oleh Suryani M. Menginjak dasawasa kau telah tinggal dengan bersama, meninggalkan beributannya. Bagaimana bisa kau pergi dari kehidupan fana? Bagaimana cara Tuhan mengambilmu? Sakitkah? Pula, tak kau beri tanda Akan menjadi bukti sejarah Bahwa Ratu Adil tak ada lagi Di Nusantara Janji penguasa Janji manis belaka Seperti pejajah Akan lalas dagangan Alih-alih terkuat misteri Perut nyawa Yang ada hanya drama Drama, drama Di masa habis jabatan di meja hijau si fakta terusir minggir Si pemegang palu membuat keputusan tak panjang pikir Saksi-saksi dan terdakwa mangkir Tapi sahabat dan aktivis akan terus hadir Dalam hati dan ingatan mereka jasamu terukir Sekarang penguasa baru telah terpilih dalam Pesta Demokrasi 9 Juni Penguasa terdahulu bilang Kisahmu menjadi test of our history Berharap penggantinya berseru Kasusmu takkan pernah berhenti sampai di sini oleh Gayatri WN Barang siapa bangga sebagai bangsa Indonesia Maka Pancasila akan membuatnya bahagia Barang siapa menghayati Pancasila Bineka Tunggal Ika Pastilah dibela Barang siapa menghidupi kebinekaan Sekali-kali tidak akan membenci perbedaan Apabila kita semua tidak lupa sumpah pemuda Bercerai-berai berbahasa asing takkan kita tergoda Apabila pemimpin tidak lupa pidato trisakti Ia akan melayani negeri dan rakyat sepenuh bahagia 
apabila pemimpin disiplin pun tidak korupsi, maka rakyatnya turut disiplin pun menjadi bersih. Apabila rakyat rajin bekerja dan pandai bersyukur, maka Indonesia akan sejahtera semakin makmur. Barang siapa mengakui sila pertama, tidaklah ia akan merusak agama. Barang siapa yang meniminat, yang memimani Tuhan yang Maha Esa, tidak ia akan mencelakai makhluk tak berdosa. Apabila bangsa ini menjalin nilai-nilai keagamaan, maka keberagaman dijunjung sebagai keniscayaan. Apabila pemerintah menjunjung nilai-nilai ketuhanan, tidak akan pemerintah membiarkan terjadi perpecahan. Mereka yang meyakini dosa jika membunuh dan mencuri, tidak akan mereka menjalimi dan korupsi walau seujung jari. Jika pemimpin memberikan teladan, rakyat akan turut dengan sepadan. Jika orang tua mengajarkan kasih Tuhan sebagai panduan hidup, maka pewaris negeri akan menyalakan kembali cinta yang berbeda. Barang siapa mengakui sila kedua, kepada nurani ia akan setia sampai tua. Barang siapa hendak menjadi manusia sejati, kepada alam dan seisinya, ia akan berbudi pekerti. Barang siapa berbudi pekerti kepada seluruh alam, tidaklah ia akan bersikap aniaya dan kejam. Apabila sila kedua dijunjung oleh pemerintah, Hukuman harusnya ditegakkan kepada yang bersalah. Apabila pemimpin bersikap adil dan beradab, maka rakyat tidak akan berbuat jahat dan biadab. Jika semangat 45 kembali menyala di jiwa sebagai api suci, tidak terulang lagi 1965 dan semua luka yang dilambung pertiwi. Apabila pemimpin dan rakyat menjunjung kemanusiaan Niscaya bangsa ini akan diberkati dalam kemuliaan <tuh> Barang siapa mengambil sila ketiga Melihat Indonesia terpecah belah Ia tak akan tegak, tegak. Mereka yang ingat semua pahlawan dan sejarah revolusi Tidak akan mereka bermusuhan dan menodai demokrasi Barang siapa yang menimani Kesaan Tuhan Ia akan junjung persatuan Dan menghindari Pecah belah Mereka yang mencintai Kedua orang tua Pasti mencintai para luhur Walau sebelum bersuara Mereka yang mencintai para luhur Dalam sanggup bari Pasti menghargai pahlawan Yang telah berjuang untuk pergi Mereka yang menghargai Jasa para pahlawan Dengan putra dan putri Aceh sampai Papua Pasti berkawan jika pemimpin dan rakyat bertekad teguh dalam persatuan, akan terwujud seluruh cita-cita dan harapan akan kemajuan. Barang siapa mengakui sila keempat, disadarinya gotong royong penting demi mengenal makrif. Dalam gotong royong selalu ada musyawarah. Pemimpin, pemimpin dan rakyat tidak akan saling menumpahkan darah. Dalam musyawarah semua setia demi kepentingan bersama Pemimpin dan rakyat pasti akan menjalani syariat yang utama Barang siapa mengenal inti dari seluruh syariat Pemimpin dan rakyat tidak saling menzalimi sejak dari niat Dalam gontong royong selalu sabar mencari mufakat Pemimpin dan rakyat hidup sebagai keluarga menjalani tarikat Barang siapa yang menghayati persaudaraan dalam tarikat Tanah air dan seluruh isinya akan senantiasa mendapat berkat. Barang siapa yang jauh dari inti syariat dan tarikat karena hedonisme tak akan bermusyawarah dan bertemu royong demi individualisme. Barang siapa yang mengaku sila kelima, pastilah ia percaya pada karma. Pemimpinnya bersikap adil kepada rakyat karena baiknya akan beroleh rahmat serta inayah. Rakyat yang saling menolong dan tiada saling menai, menanyaya Karena baiknya akan beroleh bahagia sejak dari dunia 
Barang siapa yang bersikap boros dan suka mencuri Karena buruknya akan menderita sakit tidak terpenuh Barang siapa yang malas dan selalu merugikan sesama Karena buruknya akan miskin dan berhutang seumur hidupnya Barang siapa bangsa yang setia mengingat kesejahteraan sosial Negara dan tanah airnya tidak akan mendapat semua Pemimpin dan rakyat yang berdasama mewujudkan keadilan Pada mereka Tuhan akan selalu menunjukkan jalan Hendaklah bangsa berpegang teguh pada bineka tunggal kita Supaya tidak Indonesia terakhir menjadi celaka Mereka yang mengaku bineka tunggal kita dengan benar Perbedaan mashab dan golongan tidak membuatnya korban Mereka yang mencintai Indonesia dengan segala ilmu Bahagia hidupnya dalam keberagaman tiada jemput Anak bangsa yang menghargai jasa-jasa para pahlawannya Akan setia menjaga kedaulatan bangsa dan kemerdekaan manusia Pemerintah yang menjunjung kesetaraan dalam keberagaman Rakyatnya tidak akan merasa disisihkan hidupnya Orang tua dan guru yang mengeladankan kebinekaan Anak dan muridnya akan mewarisi kekayaan Bangsa yang belajar dari masa lalunya untuk meniti masa depan Akan selalu menemukan panduan dalam mewujudkan harapan Hendaklah kita terutama yang muda mengingat sumpah pemuda Supaya badai dan ombak yang menerjang bangsa segera reda Ibu dan bapak kita telah sama-sama berjuang demi negara Mari kita harus mempertahankan memajukannya tanpa jalan Hendaklah perempuan dan laki-laki menghayati kesetaraan Supaya kesejahteraan bumi pertiwi dalam pemeliharaan Dari Aceh sampai Papua Senantiasa bersatu padu Supaya manis hidup sebagai bangsa berlimpah madu Berbahasa Indonesia Dengan baik di kota maupun di desa Supaya kesatuan bangsa kita tetap jaya dan berkasa Hendaklah pemerintah memberikan pendidikan sastra dalam sejarah budaya Supaya pewaris negeri mengenal akar bangsanya Sehingga teguh berkata mereka yang meninggal sumpah pemuda Hidup damai, bekerjasama, walau berbeda beda Hendaklah para pemimpin mendatang mengingat Hendaklah para pemimpin pendatang mengingat kesehati Agar mereka mengerti bagaimana harus berbakti Pemimpin yang menggenggam Pancasila sebagai amanah Tidak akan sekali-kali ia bersikap ya. Pemimpin yang cerdik dalam siasat Arah pembangunan ekonomi, ekonominya tidak akan selesai. Pemimpin yang mengenal akar budaya dan jati diri bangsa tidak akan membiarkan keunikan dan warisan leluhurnya binasa. Penjajah asing datang dengan seribu muka supaya kita terpedaya dan tak lagi merdeka. Menetapkan menteri dan kebijakan adalah berpikir. Istilah banyak pemimpin yang tergelincir. Jika mengejar diri sendiri dan golongan sendiri untuk bahagia. Maka keutuhan dan kedaulatan bangsa jadi terhadap Pemimpin dan rakyat yang menjunjung undang-undang dasar Arah dan tujuan hidup berbangsanya tidak akan tersaksa Hukum haruslah ditegakkan dengan adil dan setara Dosa pejabat dan rakyat yang sama dipanggang dalam satu bala Warga negara haruslah taat membayar pajak Supaya, supaya tanah air tetap nyaman untuk ketinggian yang miskin dan terlantar berilah jaminan kesehatan dan pendidikan Supaya seluruh rakyat senantar sadiam dan tercerahkan Hendaklah ingat mereka yang difebel dan di pedalaman Supaya kebaikan bumi pertiwi senantiasa dalam genggam Bangsa yang menjunjung kestara laki-laki dan perempuan Kepadanya Tuhan menganugerahi berjamu Pemerintah dan pimpin tugasnya mengapi, maka semakin tinggi dan berisi akan merunduk seperti pati. Pemerintah mendatang harus mengobati bekas-bekas luka yang dahulu. Maka tidak akan ia mengulang sejarah yang penuh duka dan tak perlu. Thank you very much.
is Simon Rice. I teach law at the ANU College of Law. And I'm very grateful and honoured um, to be invited by the Indonesian Students Association to um, introduce Usman Hamid and Marcus Winston to you in a few minutes. They'll speak um, for about 15 minutes each and then we'll be able to take questions from you uh, until about 6 o'clock. I begin by acknowledging the Indigenous owners of this land. The Indigenous owners here continue to be denied their rights and they continue to fight for recognition. And I think it's apt to acknowledge that on an occasion where you have come here to acknowledge the efforts of a man who fought for democratic rights uh, in Indonesia. I'm going to just reflect very briefly um, because this is not my forum before I introduce Usman and um, Marcus. Ten years ago, I um, just finished the, the fourth time that I taught human rights to Indonesians. Uh, under the, the then Indonesian Australian Specialist Training Program, we ran human rights training for visiting Indonesians. Uh, Indonesians came and lived in Sydney for about three months, and we ran full-time human rights training courses. It was one of the highlights of my professional life to work so closely with such dedicated, enthusiastic, committed Indonesians who wanted to take back home with them an understanding of human rights law that they could take into their work. I was working with Indonesian government officials, officers of agencies, bureaucrats, judicial officers, local government officials, people who were in a position to go back to Indonesia and work locally to promote democracy in Indonesia. In that group of people, and it was four different occasions, 20 different groups of people over the years, um, there was never a member of the military. We used to all joke and try and work out which one of the group that came down was the spy. Um, we were stopped and worked it out, but we were never quite sure. I continue to be in contact with those students. It's one of the wonderful things of working with Indonesians is how close and supportive relations with them are. And I continue to get text messages and tweets and Facebook posts and contacts from those students of mine, I suppose, who are in Aceh and Ambon. Um, and Timor-Leste and Sulawesi as well as in Jakarta. All of them continuing to do the work that they have committed their lives to do locally. It was only two months after they left here to go home to, to work as human rights advocates that news came through of Muni's death. At the time I was very conscious of how little known Muni was outside Indonesia and how hugely respected he was locally. And it's, it's sad in a way that his, his recognition now comes internationally more from the fact that he died than from the work that he did in Indonesia. And yet I know, as you know, so many people continuing to do the work locally as he did, peacefully as he did, without violence as he did, insistently as he did in Indonesia. And I think it's important as we remember Munir and continue to campaign for justice around his death, to re remember the work that he did and that people can, such as yourselves and your friends continue to do. He was a lawyer. I always like seeing lawyers who work hard locally, modestly. It's not the reputation they have. But he was a legal aid lawyer who did one simple thing persistently that led to his death. He simply tried to hold the state accountable. He simply wanted to know that exercise of power was done responsibly and within an accountable framework. Not a big ask, but one that cost him his life. It may be a significant, perhaps the most significant recognition of the work he did were Indonesia to ratify the International Convention for the Prevention of Enforced Disappearances. Muniz was not an enforced disappearance. 
other campaigners in Laos and Thailand and in Indonesia have been disappeared by the state. But it's an international convention that comes very close to recognising the bravery of people such as Munir. And for Indonesia to ratify that convention would be a significant step towards recognising the legitimacy of human rights advocacy in controlling the power of the state. Indonesia might also, in recognition of the work that Munir did, repeal its laws that criminalise freedom of expression and continue to limit the kind of activity that we are engaged in. In the meantime, however, you and the diaspora, as they were called, as, as I um, as Shah had called you, continue to campaign for justice around Munir. And picking up a line from one of the poems we just heard, I think you continue to campaign to bring to fruition the tree that Munir nurtured to promote democracy and accountability in Indonesia. To speak to you with much more knowledge and insight than I have of that campaign and of Munir's work, it gives me pleasure to introduce both Usman, Usman Hamid and Marcus <coughs> Mitzna, who are going to speak from here, and I'll take a seat. So I'll ask Usman to come and speak to you first. have two options. One is to talk about the legal and political case of Munir. The other one is to touch base on the personal of Munir. I've spoken with my supervisor, Marcus Mitzman, <laughs> <laughs> and it seems that the personal one uh, connect better to the literary that we've just uh, 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 enjoyed from uh, Zubayda. So let me begin by quoting uh, what has been said by Munir. Islam is a religion of civilizations. Extremisms and intolerance destroy civilizations. This is in contrast with the functions of religion, which is to improve life. These quotes do not come from a renowned philosopher or religious figure, or political scientist. It is from Munir, a vo voicing his sense of inclusiveness and his experience, which, which showed much extremism, led him instead to inclusiveness and a love of life through the diversity of human faiths. This is one reason why we commemorate the death of Munir. First, in Munir, humanity is the foundations of religion. Munir, we knew, was not someone who helped others out of religiosity. He rarely utter religiously related remarks. His apparent hiding of his religiosity may have been the result of, of his interaction with the weak and the oppressed. He once said to me, if anyone is murdered, or if a worker has an accident at the work, or on the street. Anyone should help him without thinking whether his action is in line with the Quran or with the Bible. In his youth, one would not find such remarks. Munir's youth was marked with violence. From his own stories, he was frequently ready to hit or to throw someone with something, maybe in part given his small figure. As a human rights activist, he once received an award and was accused of being or abusing the cash price of his organizations. Clippings of the media reports reached the market and his neighborhood, and Munir was very angry. He said, if that happened a long time ago, I would have tossed the glass at the person. Munir said, but he can fight and he can feel it. People can accuse me of anything, 
but not for being a thief that saddened me the most. The young Munir's inclinations to anger affected everything from his relationship to religious issues. But later, he became more critical after he met a professor at Brawijaya University, where he studied in East Java. Young activists of Munir, as an activist of Indonesian Association of Students, HME, took a closer look at his organization's statutes. He realized that Islam recognizes injustice and that there are those who are violated. Islam, Munir learned, was there for the violated, for the oppressed. <coughs> As if in a miracle, Munir changed. He then became very spiritual in his religious practice, transcending formal lines of religion. He prioritized making the best of improving himself and the life of others. Not everyone has experienced extremism, restlessness, or sensitivity like me. If everyone did, he might still be among us. Loving life can be born out of living religions and also out of solidarity with others in need. Munir could sense the suffering of others. His efforts to improve men's dignity, women's dignity, whereby resisting this to succumb the power, fear, and the oppression. What religion permits violence anyway? <coughs> in this sense, Munir might have been in contrasting position with those whose understanding of Islam was limited to the text without the context of the teachings. But this precisely was the universal challenge of activists like Munir. In the book, Universal Human Rights in Theory and Practice, Jack Dunley notes the contemporary development of Islamic thoughts by quoting Zakaria and Maudut. The essential argument of many writers is that contemporary doctrines of human rights repeat Islamic notions born 1,400 years ago. For instance, Maudut wrote that Islam has laid the basis of universal basic rights as a comprehensive unity which should be noted and respected in all conditions. But Donnelly also notes the reaction of conservative figures such as Majid Kaduri, who is of the view that human rights is a privilege of Allah, for he is the main authority over such rights and freedoms. Therefore, the incoherency here is that human rights are God's rights, and that Islam concludes that human rights are not rights, but obligations and that a person entitlement to, to right is a consequence of his status or action, not a moral fact related to being human. If someone's right is only based on obligation and interdependence of one's duty to God and society, that is not human rights. Over and over, Munir would encounter people judging human rights as a Western product, because they said Islam does not recognize human rights. And over and over, he would explain that human right was a result of the development of civilizations. Such rights were born out of the suffering of the victims all over the world. That of war victims, genocide, forced disappearances, as Professor Simon Rapp mentioned, and other forms of violence which continue to today. There is the issue of knowledge and how we understand God's teaching. More so because of our knowledge affects our actions. The sociologists, Max Weber has reminded us of the importance of theology. He said it was important because there was no way to change social behavior without changing their ethical system. The ethic that has been mentioned by Zubayda as well. Munir's spirit to maintain the torch of justice is in line with the general spirit of the Quran. To realize and to uphold justice, equality, and peace in society. Siding with victims, workers, and the poor was the core of practicing justice in Munir's political actions. Munir's spirit to maintain the, his Munir struggle was therefore universal. In South Africa, Munir was Mandela. In the United States, Munir was Martin Luther King. Such universality is remembered in the figure of all human rights defenders in the world. The principle of justice fought by this humanist is universal in nature and goes beyond justice, which is abstract and ideals. So this is the similar of the goals of Islam, to become a universal religion and love to the world. 
upholding human values like justice should be in religious culture. Yes. <laughs> the Quran's mission is to free humans from humans and inequality. Interpretations which differ from principles of justice should be refuted. The second lesson learned with Ad I'd learned from Munir is, is that his humanity is his foundation for nationhood. Munir's friends knew him as both human rights activist and human rights thinker, and also one who thought deeply on na nationhood. Munir said one day, to build a strong nation, <clears throat> rejecting to build a strong nation, is that to build a nation that one could not rely on values which were against bonding the nation and which rejected principles of justice. This is why it was important to view the danger of militarism in Munir's view in attempts to rebuild a nation with democracy as the bonding factor, as the foundations with which to build the nation's character. Robert Nazix, the right is uh, libertarian, but also an expert on the tradition of social contracts, writes in Anarchy State in Utopia that theories of justice should comprise theories of justice in even of takeover, justice and distribution, and redressing injustice. Edmund Kant notes the fact that it is easier to identify injustice compared to justice. He writes that justice is the active process of remedying, of preventing what arouses the sense of justice. In Munir, nationhood thus goes beyond narrow nationalisms, which prioritizes national identity. In his acceptance speech of the Right Livelihood Award, Munir expressed his, cosmopol his cosmopolitan thoughts on the global citizens of an integrating world. In the future, Munir said, while following his footstep in his footstep of Willy Brandt, Munir said that we need to consider the possibilities of an integrating world on the basis of humanity, on solidarity. The evil conducted by the states in the name of progress and development can only be reduced if we can know ourselves as a part of another human's nature. Willy Brandt was the former chancellor of the West Germany, who tried to improve relations with then East Germany, Poland, and the Soviet Union. Munir's told everyone about fear. In Munir's thoughts, religions also place humanity at the core, like ideas and actions that he has been doing until the death came. Civilized nations, according to Munir, also prioritize humanity in social relationships. But Munir's critical thoughts on nationhood and religion led a backlash in the forms of attacks and allegations of being anti-Islam, communist, atheist, Jews, and anti-nationalist. Munir's life experience proved that it is no simple matter to revive humanism in nationhood and religious life amid our social and political reality. The attacks and accusations targeted at Munir were not merely verbal or black propaganda, there were also physical attacks to the office, to his house, to his family, and to himself, finally, a death. The attacks ranged from general, a general who wanted him dead, a package of high explosive in front of his mother's door, or an explosion at his home, or his wives and children, and attacks of our office involving hundreds of thugs, and at the end, the poisoning with arsenic. All these methods were brutal ways of cowards in panic. For the attacks were not targeted at Munir alone, but also universality of human rights. These methods of terror clearly spread fear, which grows on fertile grounds in repressive states. Fear silenced people, including many politicians and religious figures of the dark past of Indonesia, from intellectuals. As a human, Munir had fear, but his humanity and solidarity to others conquer, conquer his fear. What we fear is that fear itself, Munir would say. Here we, we recall the words of Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he was installed as a, pres as a president of the United States in 1933, when he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. These were not his original aider. A French essayist, Michel de Montaigne, may have been the responsible for making the press popular. The thing I fear most 
is the fear itself. This is what always said by Munir. And Munir may have not intended to quote anyone. It was a statement he needed to keep up the struggle, to break through the tyranny of silence. He realized that anything in the way of activists, such as bullets or tanks, were not really major obstacles. The biggest constraint was in the mind is fear. Fear, said Roosevelt, has no name. Fear, said Munir, reduces our sensibility and rationality to take action. It is no coincidence that such faith is shared by Christianity, that the root of sin is fear. It is neither a coincidence that such a faith in humanity and universal justice is the foundation for inclusive theologies. Theologies are also about action, upholding the right and fighting the wrongs, as is also recognized in Islam and all religions. Once of Munir fingers was almost severed by when he was terrorized as his foot by the worker and as he stood by workers who had been dismissed. He would comfort those whose family members disappeared or were victims of forced disappearance. He even helped in the release of a member of special forces of the military who was taken hostage by the armed groups in Aceh. Munir was courageous to, be, to become bold and conquer his fear. He fought it with love. As Eric Fromm said, a love with humanity, humility, courage, and discipline. A love, a love found between parents and their child, among fellow humans, a love to God, a universal of love. Munir's widow, Munir's wife, remember, his, remember him as a man who loved life. He loved his family and looked after his fish. And his chicken? <laughs> Sorry, what? What chicken in English? Uh, yeah. yep. and would not shy from household course. For Munir, love and solidarity were sensitivity to suffering of pain and injury from insults. Sensitivity would make it difficult for one to dismiss the other. To build solidarity, we need to go beyond our inner silver. I'm quoting here thinker Richard Rorty because of his similarities with Munir regarding solidarity. Munir was loved by by all of us, the victims he stood for, because he went beyond words and ideas and was involved in meaningful actions of change. As Rorty wrote, it is not the belief in philosophy or religion, but sensitivity towards others that enable us to be in solidarity with human beings. Thank you so much. System to reform uh, military and police legislation. Uh, he had learned quite significantly in the last few years to catch up with the vocabulary, with the terminology, with that knowledge that was necessary to allow him uh, to engage in these kinds uh, of discussions. And I was present in many of those debates he had with military officers, with police generals, and I realized how scared they were that Munir now was speaking their language. He suddenly was able to speak with them about the fears of national security, the fears of internal security in their own language, and that was something uh, they had never imagined was possible. They knew Munir as the human rights activist uh, who was using activist language, and therefore that allowed them uh, to dismiss him as not uh, being 
at the same level as them. But in the last few years before his death, he was able uh, to lead discussions with them eye to eye, uh, and that really significantly, uh, in fact, terrorized the military and uh, police officers that had to debate uh, with him. Uh, the reformulation of the State Defense Bill of 2001, the reformulation of the police legislation, uh, some of the legislation that was uh, drafted uh, up to the 2014 I bill, all of that was the result of Munoz and his colleagues' work uh, in the group of uh, Propatria. Now, again, in the middle of August, late August 2004, just uh, shortly before his departure, there was a uh, farewell that was held by this very group. Uh, in the Santika Hotel in Jakarta. Uh, people who were present included Andy Vijayanto, Lisa Sukma, Cornelis Lai, uh, Dani uh, from Lippi, several others uh, who were members of that group and who had learned from Munir uh, how to combine the passion for human rights with knowledge about security affairs and use that effectively to change uh, Indonesia's uh, security uh, infrastructure. And I think that is what made Munir so unique uh, towards the end uh, of his life. He uh, was able um, to use his knowledge, his courage, uh, his brilliant mind, not only to, def to defend individual cases of human rights violations, no, he was much more interested at that time, 2002, 2003, 2004, to actually change the structural violence uh, that was still occurring uh, in Indonesia. He was interested not <coughs> in cases, he was still, of course, listening to a lot of what was happening uh, around Indonesia, but he had concluded by that time that in order to really change reality, you needed to change the structure, the institutions, the whole setup uh, in which Indonesia's military, uh, in which Indonesia's uh, police uh, function. So in that uh, farewell, uh, I was asked to give a little speech uh, because I had become friends with Munir uh, in those uh, last years. Uh, I actually had tried uh, before he left for the Netherlands to uh, get him to the United States because I was working uh, in uh, the American Embassy at the time for USA and he wanted actually what he was most interested in in around 2002, uh, 2003 uh, was going to the National Defense University there uh, and I nominated him for a scholarship there. Uh, turned out the American Embassy blacklisted him for his uh, criticism of the United States over the Iraq war, uh, which led to a very angry exchange between me and the ambassador, which I uh, eventually won uh, after quite a long time. Munia was removed from the blacklist, but by the time when he was removed, he had already taken up the offer by uh, the Netherlands to uh, study there uh, instead. So at that farewell, uh, I was talking about two things, because Munia had uh, told me uh, there were two things he wanted to do when he was in Europe, uh, besides, of course, doing his PhD. Uh, he wanted to uh, go to many soccer <laughs> matches uh, across <laughs> Europe, uh, was one of his uh, passions, and he wanted to attend uh, a lot of seminars. He wanted to travel uh, around uh, Europe. Um, I, at the time, uh, was still struggling to finish my PhD, and so I gave him the advice not to do what he intended to do, uh, <laughs> not to go to all of these uh, uh, soccer matches, uh, not to do, go to all of these seminars, because if he didn't want to end up like me, again, me at the time in my seventh year of the PhD, uh, he, uh, as I advised him, should uh, focus on uh, his uh, PhD. Unfortunately, as we know, he never was given the opportunity to uh, do either of these things, uh, doing the soccer stuff uh, and, and, and certainly not uh, focusing on his PhD. Now, as I said, in that farewell party, <coughs> we had uh, people like Andy Vijayanto, we had people like Risa Sukmir, Cornelius Lai, uh, Dani from Lippi, and uh, you may recall that these are now the people who make up uh, the inner core, the inner circle of Jokowi's uh, political infrastructure. Andy Vijayanto, 
uh, the deputy uh, of the transition office, uh, Risa Sukma, the key uh, foreign policy advisor, uh, Dani advising uh, Stukowi on social policy and also uh, very close to uh, Megawati Cornelis Lay, of course, the main uh, liaison between Mega uh, and uh, Jacobi. So we have a lot of people in Jacobi's uh, surrounding who were <coughs> Munoz's Mun Mun friends uh, and to some extent were his students as well. All of them are very uh, much uh, full of admiration uh, for Munoz um, and I believe. Uh, we should uh, be able to see that uh, in uh, the upcoming uh, administration. Now before I go to some of the challenges uh, that Jokowi will face to actually reopen this case uh, and bring it to a conclusion, uh, let us look for a while at why the case hasn't been resolved uh, in the last uh, 10 years and the focus here obviously has to be on uh, SPY. Uh, as we've seen in the film, and as I think most of us will remember, uh, in that meeting with Suchiwati, um, SPY said, this is a test case, I will basically evaluate the success of my administration at the ability uh, of this administration to solve the Munia case. This is something we absolutely uh, have uh, to do. Now Suchiwati, of course, at the time believed in uh, the seriousness of uh, Yuda Yono's uh, promise, but as she found out, uh, a lot of other people did as well. You know, SPY has this tendency of making promises to a lot of people and never keeps uh, any uh, of them, and Suchibati so found that that was exactly what, uh, what happened to her. Of course, the case has not been resolved. Uh, the people in the background uh, who were responsible for the murder have not been brought uh, to uh, justice uh, and certainly uh, the SPY administration is responsible for that. But it is much more than just a personal failure uh, of SPY uh, that led to this failure. Um, it is much more the general setup that SPY has made possible over the last 10 years uh, that has created this failure. What do I mean by the general setup? I mean the kind of people he has put in place, the kind of institutions he has allowed to develop, were simply not capable of leading a case like this to a conclusion. It's very clear that if you want a case like this uh, to be resolved, uh, you not only as president have to stand in the background and try to push uh, that case to a resolution, you have to put the right people in place who actually can do that. In this case, it means uh, a courageous, a reformist uh, police chief, a very brave uh, attorney general, and judges, you know, chief uh, justices who actually can reform the legal system. If you don't have these three uh, leaders in place, then of course it will be difficult. And there's no indication uh, that SPY ever in his 10 years attempted uh, to put the right people into these positions, uh, to put an Attorney General uh, into that office that could clean up this highly corrupt institution. Uh, he had promised, as we know, one of his other promises uh, that never was fulfilled uh, several times uh, to make someone like Todon Molnia Lubis um, Attorney General, that never happened because uh, too many people would have advised SPY uh, that that was not uh, what he would have an interest in. Uh, somebody like Toto Molia Lubis, of course, would create a lot of conflict with the entrenched structures within the office of the Attorney General, and the last thing SPY wanted was conflict. So you put people in who just told the line, who are part of the uh, entrenched elite who are part of the apparatus that has been corrupt for many decades uh, and continue to produce uh, corrupt uh, cadres. So again, the Attorney General's office, the way it has been run, the way it has been managed by SBY in the, in the last 10 years was simply not capable of bringing a case like this to a successful conclusion and I would argue that was quite deliberate. If he had wanted uh, to bring a case like this 
uh, to trial and actually lead to uh, 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 solutions, and then he would simply have appointed other people to do that uh, for him. As we see in the film, it wasn't quite uh, clear brought out, but one of the reasons why the case was never brought to a conclusion was in fact this very weak indictment. I mean, we all, I mean, people who knew the case very well knew by the, case, by the time the indictment was written that it would not lead uh, to uh, uh, you know, a verdict against uh, Mufti. That was very clear. So it wasn't only the judges uh, that released him, that acquitted uh, Mufti, but in fact based on the way the evidence was written up in a very weak way by the Attorney General's office uh, didn't leave uh, the judges much uh, choice. The same applies to the police. We haven't had a single reformist uh, police officer in the office of Chief of Police uh, in the almost 10 years. Now, admittedly, it's very difficult to find a reformist uh, police officer among the entire elite because, you know, this kind of system, this kind of apparatus produces corrupt officers and by the time they come up to two star, three star and eventually four star, if you need to appoint a chief of police from that pool, it becomes very difficult but nevertheless SPY didn't try very hard uh, to find uh, the most reformist out of this uh, bunch of uh, traditionalists uh, available uh, to him. He always appointed very safe choices including uh, the current uh, police chief who is arguably in fact the least reformist out of all of them he had uh, in the past. And again, if you are hoping for a police to actually solve a case like Munoz, bring all of the strings of evidence together, you know, connect the dots, the phone calls that we've seen, again, that's mind-boggling that the police would not be able to build a case around that very overwhelming evidence, but again, if you don't appoint the right people to the job, then you get the outcome uh, that you, in fact, expected from the very uh, beginning. The third uh, institution, SBY, has uh, failed to reform uh, is, of course, the justice sector. Once again, uh, very, very conservative appointments. No one, uh, not in the ministry, not in uh, the key judicial uh, institutions where he actually had an influence over, uh, did he appoint people from uh, about whom we could be confident that they have a reformist agenda. Again, every time it was consistent with this pattern of appointing conservative uh, status quo uh, judges uh, or other uh, legal experts to very important posts uh, in uh, the judiciary and its associated apparatuses. Again, given that team SBY had put together, uh, it was no surprise that we have seen uh, this outcome. And then again, everyone who knows SBY personally, who knows that you know he often makes very strong statements, very strong promises, but then doesn't follow up on them, uh, would understand and appreciate how this case didn't come uh, to a resolution. <coughs> now to Jacoby, what can we expect from there? And I'm sorry that probably I can't be overly optimistic when it comes to uh, the prospects of reopening this case uh, and uh, bringing it to a, a resolution. As I mentioned, we do have in the inner circle uh, quite a number of people who are personally um, friends with Munir have a great passion uh, for him and what happened to him, but the overall political infrastructure is not uh, you know, positioned in a way that would make us terribly optimistic uh, that we see a breakthrough uh, in this particular case. And let me explain to you why. Again, if we go through the field, these three institutions that I mentioned, that are key to the resolution of this conflict, uh, Jokowi will face significant difficulties in actually putting reformers into uh, these kinds uh, of positions. Remember, for instance, that in order to get a chief of police through, once again, uh, the pool is very limited. People who are already two or three stars are uh, often status quo 
officers within the police, so it's very difficult to find someone uh, to push through. And even if he did find somebody uh, who would, for instance, promise to take up the Munir case again, uh, this person would still have to be approved by Parliament. And this is something we, as political observers, expect to be very tough in the first few months, that, con that conflict between Parliament uh, and Jokowi as president. You know, he can't, that's the constitution, he can't appoint a police chief by himself. Whatever uh, candidate he chooses needs to go through a process in the DPR. Uh, and that's been, as has been I found uh, in uh, late 2004 and early 2005, that's very difficult if you face a hostile uh, DPR. We expect uh, in the first few months at least uh, of the Jokowi presidency a pretty uh, tough ride for Jokowi in the DPR as long as Golkar, for instance, is still under the control of uh, Abdul Isal Bakri, as long as the uh, Prabowo coalition still stands, as long as this, uh, posts are being distributed in the DPR, I would expect that that coalition holds. Of course, as we move forward, it will uh, disintegrate, but it will be very difficult for Jokowi to put into place a police chief at the beginning of his presidency that is actually in line uh, with his political agenda. Now, SBY found that in 2004, uh, when he came in, he had to leave the incumbents in place because he couldn't get through his own uh, candidate. So that's number one. Uh, for the police, I'm very pessimistic uh, that you actually could find uh, somebody uh, who can clean up the house and re open uh, this case and, and push it forward. How about the Attorney General's office? There, uh, he actually has more room to maneuver because it's a cabinet appointment. It's only him uh, who has the authority to appoint an Attorney General. Uh, but then again, uh, there are certain realities within the Attorney General's office that probably he will be told a lot about by his advisors. Um, you will be told, I'm sure, uh, by some of these uh, experts that putting a complete outsider uh, into that post uh, will be dangerous because uh, this infrastructure in the Attorney General's office has a tendency of simply shutting down if there are outsiders who challenge the way business is being done uh, in that office. Uh, that's one of the reasons why SPY has always put people into that post uh, who were actually acceptable uh, to the majority of the bureaucrats working uh, in the Attorney General's office. So uh, whoever believes that you know, he simply can appoint somebody who is a radical, who is a, a, you know, a reformer who comes in and completely breaks down all of these crusted uh, structures within the Attorney General's office, uh, is probably a bit overly optimistic. I uh, would assume that he will try to find a moderate uh, who has an agenda for reform, uh, but will try uh, to implement that rather slowly. And I would also uh, assume uh, that probably the Munia case is not uh, on the priority list, uh, unfortunately. Uh, then, uh, of course, you have the judiciary. Um, what can Jacobi do about the judiciary? Um, the ways, the instruments through which a president in Indonesia these days can influence the judiciary are increasingly limited uh, because the judiciary in the last few years has built itself a fortress uh, that allows very little intrusion uh, by external forces, and that includes the President as well. The President can, of course, appoint the Minister for uh, Justice and Human Rights, and of course, uh, we hope that Jacobi will appoint a reformer uh, to that post, but uh, what the Supreme Court, for instance, has done over the last 10 years is, is separating itself out from the Ministry, uh, and a lot of the internal operations uh, of the Supreme Court are now run autonomously uh, through um, the Supreme Court itself. The Supreme Court is reproducing itself constantly, uh, internally, uh, without allowing reformist influence uh, from um, outside. So having said all of that, I think we should 
lower our expectations. Uh, we all, of course, want to see the Munya case uh, resolved. Uh, however, um, there will be disappointments, there will be compromises Jacobi uh, will have to make. Uh, there will be a lot of resistance from these various institutions, from the police, the Attorney General's Office, uh, the uh, judiciary towards radical reform. But as I said, it's not enough for a president to push these cases. You need to have these three institutions actually buying into the process uh, and, and pushing it uh, forward. Then, of course, we have the problem that all of you are aware of, that uh, in Jokowi surrounding uh, and Megawati surrounding, there are people who have very direct links to this case uh, and who will certainly uh, try to uh, use their influence to prevent a reopening of this case. Uh, and I applaud everyone uh, in this room and outside uh, who have you know, made their views known. Uh, about what Jacobi needs to do with these people. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Andrew Briono being uh, the most prominent among them, uh, and that he should not uh, appoint Andrew Briono to any position uh, of political influence. That's central, of course, uh, to uh, his reformist agenda. But I, again, I want to warn here, it's not only about Andrew Briono. Don't believe that if Andrew is taken care of, uh, this case can be reopened. Uh, the police, the Attorney General uh, and the Judiciary will uh, prove formidable opponents uh, towards any kind of push uh, towards reform. Thank you very much. We have 15 minutes for questions, which Brett uh, is going to invite us. Just put your hands up and I'll call on you. We don't have a microphone, so you just have to speak up. Yes, sir. Um, one of the reasons why I think this case is so important is, is not just to achieve justice for uh, Munir's widow and his supporters, but because of the message it sends uh, today that you can get away with it, that those that try to silence uh, dissenters or human rights campaigners can get away with it. And so achieving justice for um, the, the crime of 2004 can have an effect on contemporary Indonesia. I wonder to what extent um, the, the lack of justice for the case of Munir, but also the cases of the violence of the 1960s and the anti-communist uh, pogroms that occurred, and the violence of 1998, the fact that few or, or in some cases no one has been held to account for those, to what extent it affects the way that uh, Indonesia operates today? I should have asked, I'm sorry, do you mind just introducing yourself? Uh, my name is uh, Ari, I lived in Indonesia for a couple of years. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, since the very beginning, uh, we believe that the death of Munir is a symbol of a structural human rights violations in Indonesia. Even days before he was murdered, Munir was involved in a series of demonstrations criticizing the government and the judiciary for releasing all perpetrators of crimes against humanity in East Timor and also in a mass killing in 1984 in Anjou, where most of Muslims were being murdered. So, <clears throat> I think, borrowing the, the, the statement from Yudayono, the reopening of the case of Munir will be the key whether Jokowi will move further prosecuting past human rights abuses starting from the 60s. I believe that uh, people around Jokowi have commitment for uh, achieving justice for past human rights abuses. As we can see from the, the official document of Jokowi and Yusuf Kala, Fission and Mission, which is clearly mentioned that most of the past human rights abuses started from the 65 to uh, 1990s have been mentioned and, and Jokowi will <coughs> uh, will address such matter in his administration. However, <coughs> uh, Dr. Marcus has already mentioned some challenges, which I think uh, there is only one single major case which might be possible for Jokowi to, to, to deliver, which is the 
the, the enforce of disappearance of pro-democracy activists in 1998. Why? Because one, there has been an uh, official recommendation made by the parliament back in 2009 to Indonesian president to set up an ad hoc human rights court. Second is to set up a commission of fact-finding <coughs> to find the fate and the whereabouts of the missing activists. Third is to provide rehabilitation and compensation. Fourth is to ratify the Convention on, uh, on the Protections of All Persons from Enforced Disciplines. The fourth recommendation has already been in progress where Minister of Foreign Affairs has signed the Convention and waiting for further process from the Parliament to ratify this Convention. And the rest three uh, recommendations, I believe that it would be fully in the hands of Jokowi. It wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be depend on political approval of the parliament, uh, just like for other major cases. So I think this is the only one possible case that would be uh, uh, delivered by Jokowi. But uh, however, again, the challenge is not only the presidentship of Jokowi, but also the judiciary. Marcus has mentioned that judiciary is very weak, please. So, yeah, I think that's the only uh, 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 hope, the window of opportunity for the future of uh, human rights, for passive uses. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Andreas Arsona. I'm working for Human Rights Watch. I have a Andreas is the one who bring these posters from Jakarta to Canberra, so thank you for doing this. Someone said it is cheaper to print in Jakarta. <laughs> <laughs> KPI, sorry. <laughs> uh, I would like to know the pool of potential chiefs, the pool for the potential Supreme Court Chief Justice, and also potential Attorney General for Jokowi. I know that Al Tijo Alcosta is among the Supreme Court justices. I think he's a good guy. I would like to know of all these existing vote among three star general or senior uh, public prosecutors in Jakarta, who are the most possible reformers? And I, I know that a lot of you understand quite a lot among all these potential. Uh, official in, on, in, in those three institutions? Well, I mean, that, that's a problem. I, I think the term reformist in these kinds of ranks is really relative. Right? I mean, uh, you would have to look at the track record. You would have to look at their wealth. You know, the uh, police commission has, mm -hmm. I think, done quite a bit of work on that, uh, notably. You know, look at how much money do police officers have in their accounts and where it's coming from. Uh, but in terms of a really clean track record, reformist record, you know, it, it is very difficult to find anyone. I think to find the least conservative one is probably uh, the, bigger, the bigger challenge or the more realistic challenge uh, for Jacobi and that applies to, to all of the three institutions. But again, uh, for uh, the Chief Justice, for instance, it's not only the president who appoints that justice, there's a long process involved in that, DPR has a say in it and so on, so uh, it becomes a, a process of political compromising, uh, then it's about, you know, who does the president want, who does the DPR want, who does the majority of the political parties want, who does Megawati want, you know, uh, and so I would not be able to come up at this point with a list of uh, police officers um, at that rank, two or three star, uh, who would be real reformers. And quite frankly, if I had one, I wouldn't mention uh, him because that would be a death sentence for that person. Uh, once that's out, you know, oh, this guy is a reformer, that does the trick uh, for a lot of the conservative forces around Jacobi in the DPR, in the government, to actually prevent that person uh, from from getting up. So we will just have to see uh, how uh, this whole game plays out. I mean, SPY, for instance, I remember very clearly the last two occasions when he chose a police officer. 
he was actually so annoyed by a lot of the NGOs who told him you have to appoint this one that he made a case out of not appointing this person. And in the both the last two cases, he appointed the, the only person who was actually not in the race in the newspapers because he felt he, he needed to state his presidential authority by appointing somebody who was not pushed by the media, or pushed by political parties, or pushed by the lobbyists around him. So again, mentioning names now uh, may actually be kind of a We have time for a couple more questions. Somebody would like? Yes. I guess since we're sitting here in Australia, oh, I'm Elaine Pearson, also from Human Rights Watch. Um, what role do you see uh, foreign governments, like Australia or the US, in pushing for accountability? And I guess how can they do that effectively, or you know, is there a concern that that could hinder uh, these efforts? Uh, <clears throat> that's a very important question. So I think uh, the murder of Munir, the murder of Munir, is an internationally known case of murder of human rights defender. So from a couple of years, uh, I've been doing that focusing uh, since the beginning. It was also help uh, by the support of the international community. It has been an attention of uh, UN reporter Philip Salson of extrajudicial killing and uh, uh, executions, also special reporter on human rights defender Hina Jelani, and special reporter on independent judiciary Leandro Despoy. They wrote a letter to the president, US Congress from Republican Democrat also wrote, uh, wrote a letter to Yudhoyono. Uh, the Netherlands Parliament from both uh, from that from diverse of political party from Christian Democrat PVDA etc have also addressed the matter to to Indonesian authority. Even more than 400 uh, member parliaments in the European Union have signed a let have signed an official declarations addressing the questions of Munir in on behalf of the European member pa in the European Parliament, and that was very uh, well uh, appreciated by the chair the chief of the criminal investigation department at that time, I remember, from the police. He was like, really wants that uh, support from international community so that he can uh, push for more uh, action toward his sub subordinates to take more uh, investigative uh, uh, process in the case of Munir. And if we look into the time frame of the progress, for example, the, I think the most uh, important moment was in 2008 where former commander of special forces, where former uh, uh, deputy five of intelligence agency was finally detained by the police. It was just less than a year after all the letters sent by the UN reporters, Congress, Netherlands uh, Parliament, even uh, I think Australian Parliament, I remember I accompanied Suchi Wati two times to meet with the, uh, with the Senate and also the member parliament in, in Australia. So it is important to to, to resend the message to the world that there is an unfinished uh, agenda for Indonesia and also for international community, which is the unresolved murder of Indonesian human rights defender, Munir Saitan. Final question. Final opportunity. Very well. Oh, well. Yeah, um, uh, you said in your speech that um, how. Uh, he changed the way um, he approached uh, human rights, taking on more than just individual cases, but taking on the structures and the institutions. Would you say that there's been a lasting impact in terms of how human rights activists now in Indonesia are, are, are dealing in their advocacy, and are they now taking on the, the institutional structures in a bigger way as a result? <laughs> no, 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 but I think he was an example, right? I mean, um, this is exactly what Munir wanted to do, and he told me uh, over the last two years before he left, you know, I, I know that if I really want to change Indonesia, I need to understand the structure, I need to be able to speak the language of the people I need to negotiate with, and that's the military and the police uh, and the legal uh, sector. I need to be able to broaden my horizon to understand how things are done across the world and when I come back then I can apply my my knowledge um, even more effectively than I have in the past. <coughs> and that's, this is what uh, this gentleman is doing uh, right now. And, and of course there's no one uh, 
who has followed Munir better in his example than, than Usman has, and, and he's again following once more in his, in his footsteps, trying to channel that activism in a structural way that actually can penetrate discussions of institutional change in Indonesia and not only, again, the, the, the handling of cases is very, very important, but the structural reform of the system that actually prevents the repetition of these cases uh, is uh, arguably even, even, even more important. And we see more and more people going down that path uh, that, that Munir went or tried to go uh, as he left for the Netherlands and that is really uh, you know, transforming and translating that activism into powerful intellectual messages that then can change the foundations of the system. <coughs> Another question? I was just stretching it. Thank you. <laughs> Could you join me in thanking this man? <laughs> People leaving the room would like to invite you to join us in the photo session, one man, one poster. <laughs> <laughs>